To God be glory. To God be glory, great things he hath done. We're grateful and honored to have this fourth opportunity. We've gotten a chance to come. I was asked, well, where's your wife? She told me, send a message, tell y'all, don't be selfish. She said she was with us the 29th. She was with us the 3rd. She was with us the 17th. And this is the last Sunday, by the way, of the year before New Year. And great opportunity to, you know, be in service with, you know, some of the family. Somebody asked, well, why aren't you there with them? Because I've got a mission here. Give glory to God. <laughs> but we're grateful and we're honored and we thank you for this opportunity. And as so we look back, because I often say there are few views we have to take. There's a retrospective, there's a prospective, and there's an introspection. Retrospect is where we look back and Remember the great things God had done. I was reading a verse in the 104th Psalm that said, God had crowned the year with his goodness. And I'm sure everybody's testimony in the house would be that God certainly is good and had been good. Then we do an introspection. Every time we get the opportunity to come, we take a look within. Examine ourselves, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. Then there's a perspective where we're just taking outward look or maybe a look forward. We come to the end of 2017. We get ready to look forward and we hope this is not just a traditional service. Hope this is not where we come and say, well, I've made this resolution, I've made this resolution, that we've come and we've made a commitment. And the commitment that we trust and hope is made, we'll be looking at a passage. Can you come down, Anthony, a little on the volume? I got echo. We'll be looking at a passage from the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew. First Gospel, Matthew 7, we're going to begin reading verse 24, and it's Jesus' first recorded sermon when he comes on the scene, and he had a lot to say. We've heard some profound words from Dr. and Pastor David Platt. Heard some profound words when we came in from Elder David Bowman, who was speaking and giving us some insights, and we certainly read some profound words from that classic passage in Romans chapter 7. These words, if you have the red letter edition, are in R-E-D, red, and that means Jesus is the one speaking. It's oftentimes, and I think it's fitting to say this as we're turning to the passage, different preachers come and we all bring Elder Bowman, our different personalities, our styles that God blessed us with, but we still preach the word of God. I remember reading a passage in Exodus chapter 20 where the children of Israel looked at Moses and said, Moses... We want you to speak to us because if God speak to us, we'll die. Moses looked at him and said, well, what I got to tell you come from God. If you don't do what he told you to do, you're going to die anyways. And I said that to say oftentimes we're too vessel oriented that we're not voice activated. And folk, we need to hear from the Lord beyond the voice of a man and beyond the pages of a book. And Jesus had something to say to a multitude. I want us to remember this. Every time Jesus spoke to a crowd and multitude, there were either three groups of people. One were like the sinners and publicans in Luke 15 where it said they came to hear Jesus gladly. It's kind of like this fellow scratches where I itch. Then there were the scribes and Pharisees who always had to find fault and mumble and grumble about what he had to say. Then there was a third group that thought they knew everything and Jesus had to show them they didn't know anything. You remember that in Matthew 13 where he began to speak in parables. They said, why are you speaking in parables? This is a new paradigm. We've never heard you speak like this. Jesus said, I'm speaking in parables because there's some people in the crowd that thinks they know everything. I'm fixing to show them they don't know what they think they know. And so, folks, we need to hear from the Lord Jesus. Stand up in honor of the reading of the word. Matthew 7, verse 24. Jesus closes out as it is recorded the sermon that is called the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to remember that speaks about its location, but it has nothing to say about the intent or the content. It should be make up your mind time on the Mount because Jesus is challenging the people with a final choice. And everybody in the room before we leave today will have to make a resolve or having made one that this is our choice. Therefore, Verse 24, Matthew 7. Whosoever heareth these sayings or teachings of mine and doeth, that is, practices them, will liken him to a wise man that built his house on rock. 
rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat up on that house and it fell not. What was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, teachings, and doeth them not, practice them, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Rains descended, floods came, the winds blew, beat up on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Father and Lord of glory, we thank you. We've come again, Lord God, to close the year you've blessed us with on the brink and the horizon of a new year. We recognize and we all say like the aged apostle, we're not there yet. Father, we press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this great gathering, Lord God, here on this beautiful Lord's Day. I ask you to bless every family represented, every church represented, elder and young alike. And as you always do, have your way in this house. You've ushered us into your presence with a voice of singing, to your very courts with a heart of praise, to your very gates with thanksgiving. And now... Lord, give us ears to hear that you would have us to hear. Certainly our prayer. In Jesus' name, and we all say it together. Amen. 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 Out of the mouth of babes, huh? <laughs> Talk a lot about the Great Commission. You heard both Elder David and Pastor David on the video speaking about the Great Commission, you really could call it the Great Commandment. Because it is a command. It's not just something that we, you know, get, get that we just maybe want to do or, you know, I, I might do it. It's a command. What I say about the Great Commission is we focus on go ye therefore, but at the end of that commandment, there's something else stated. We talk about going making disciples. We can't make disciples if we don't teach them what Jesus taught. As simple as that. Jesus closed that passage out by saying, teaching them to observe, obey. All things, not some, not many, not a few, whatsoever I have commanded you. And I say this to the church that I don't know how we can teach them what Jesus commanded if we don't ever spend time studying Jesus' sermons. If you read and study his sermons, when you read the epistles, you're like, wow, I know where Paul and Peter got that from. That's what Jesus taught them, and this is what this is all about. Because there are various sermons that Jesus preached while he was on the face of the earth, and I mean they were profound. One of them to a group in a multitude in Matthew 16, you remember, he had his disciples next to him, and he had a multitude with probably thousands probably ask the most important question that could ever be asked. In fact, three questions. First one he asked is, who do you say that I am? The apostles got it right. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, bow, it is upon this truth that I'm going to build the ecclesia, the church. It's the foundation. That was verse 13 through 16, but when he got down to verse 26, he asked a twofold question. What shall it profit anyone if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then he flipped it. Or what is anyone willing to give up in exchange for his soul? And then he closed that sermon out in verse, verse 27 by saying, The Son of Man is going to return in all of his glory, and when he does, he's going to reward everyone according to their works. What a sermon. Left a multitude stifled. They had to leave doing an introspection, wondering if they were where they needed to be. Then there's a sermon in Capernaum. That was the one he's speaking about the bread of life where he began teaching, if you'd like, pointing toward the Lord's Supper. Remember that? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood had no life in him. 
But whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath life in him. He wasn't talking about cannibalism. He was referring to the fact that one would accept his broken body and the blood that he shed. Make that commitment. Dr. Woodell was speaking about earlier, as he said, Mendidon. A lot of folks miss that. There was a verse in there that said Jesus already knew who it was in the crowd who believed on him and who it would be who would betray him. Wow. You can sit here today and think, well, my resolve and my commitment is that I'm following Christ, but he knows. He's the omniscient one. You can tell me, you can tell Elder Bowman, you can tell Dr. Woodell, you can tell Brother Orville, God knows. Then there was an eschatological sermon that he preached. Remember that one in Matthew 24? Those disciples asked a threefold question. There were questions that everybody in the room, it's sad state in case the world is in today, we're asking them, huh? Because they were bragging about the temple. Look at this beautiful temple. Look at those stones, Jesus said. Got news for you, fellas. It's coming down. They were like, wait. This is a structure of permanency. What do you mean it's coming down? So when he left the temple and crossed the brook Kedron and went over into the Mount of Olives, they pulled him to the side privately and they asked him a threefold question. Lord, when are these things going to happen? What's going to be the sign of your coming? And Lord, when is the end of the world coming? He began to start enumerating some of the signs and boy, we're seeing them. But he finally answered the question in verse 36 of Matthew 24 that says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when I return. Anybody remember how it was in the days of Noah? Genesis 6 and 5 says in the days of Noah that God looked down upon the earth and saw that the wickedness of humanity was great. That every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. Why are we surprised at some of the stuff folk do? Know how else it was in Noah's day? Noah, go preach. Go preach and tell him I'm coming back and whoever does not get on the ark is going to die. You got preachers in and out preaching. You got folks saying, wow, look at that fool. When they said that about Noah, it had never rained in seven generations. God watered the ground from the dew up. And Noah's preaching said it's going to rain. They're like, man, you're going to lost your mind. And that's what they're saying about preachers that preach continually. And Jesus said, that's the way it'll be when I come back. Wow. Know how else it was in Noah's day? All those seven generations from Adam at least all the way down to Enoch and then comes Noah. If you read the genealogy in, in, in Matt, uh, uh, Genesis 5, it said these men not only had sons, but they had sons and daughters. You know how many people were probably on the earth by the time they got to Noah? How many got on the boat? Wow. Noah, Miss Noah. Ham. Miss Ham, Sham, Miss Sham, Japheth, Miss Japheth. Eight people got on the ark, and all the rest of them said, we don't believe God. Isn't that incredible? Peter confirmed that in 1 Peter 3 when he said eight folks got on the boat. Know how else it was in Noah's day? After the rain started coming, they began to say, oh, we want in now. Know what Noah said? It's too late. God shut the door and I can't open it. Finally, you know how else it was in Noah's day? Jesus said there will be some taken and there will be some left. Wow. Boy, you got to read his sermons. Powerful. And then comes this one. It comes on the heels of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been preaching, and John was a great theological preacher. I mean, he preached on soteriology, that salvation, telling men to repent and believe the gospel. Preached on pneumatology, which is a study of the Holy Spirit. Preached on eschatology, telling them Jesus is coming back and he's going to bring judgment. 
boy, the, the, the crux of his message was Christology. He certainly pointed people toward Christ. I said it before and I'll say it again. When Jesus made the statement in Matthew 11, out of all men born of a woman, there's none greater than John the Baptist. I'm convinced he's saying there's nobody that were able to point people away from themselves and point them to Jesus better than John the Baptist. Boy, when we learn that. This is a sermon that I think we think is palatable. I think we think it's one that, you know, is kind of, you know, rosy. Some of our favorite sayings are in this sermon, huh? Matthew 5, we read the Beatitudes, verses 1 through 12. We love them, don't we? Verses 13 through 16, salt and light. We love that passage, don't we? Verse 44 in Matthew 5, we use it as a quote sometime, love your enemies. By the time you get to chapter 6, we have some other favorite passages. From 9 through 13, we have the Lord's Prayer. We sung a song earlier, this world is not my home, and we usually use Matthew 6, 21 for where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. Ain't it incredible how we'll grab Matthew 7 and 1 when folks begin to get opinionated or kind of in a sense throw some judgment at us and we say, now nah, Matthew 7 and 1 says don't judge lest you be judged. We love to go to the Sermon on the Mount, huh? Then verse 6, that cliche folks use, don't cast your pearls before the swine. Wow. Boy, we love verse 12 in chapter 7, huh? What we call it the golden rule. Some folk can't even quote it right. Do unto others as they do unto you. That is not what it says. <laughs> Jesus said, and as you would men do unto you, do also unto them. And then in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, wow, here comes a choice. Jesus done all this preaching and he looks at this multitude and says, now here comes a choice of finality. It says, make up your mind. Because he comes on the scene where religion is prevalent. You read Matthew 15, tradition was making the word of God of none effect. You had to look at the people of Jerusalem and borrow a verse from Ezekiel 33 when he said, this people draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For you teach for doctrine the commandments of men and you make the word of God non-effect. Sounds like a day we live in. When Jesus comes on the scene, they're rituals, they're religious, they're traditionalist. Judaism was a, a holy system. It was a system that God ordained that was supposed to point toward a sacrificial lamb that would come and give his life for the sin of the world. And God pictured it in Judaism through temple sacrifices and worship. But do I need to tell you, when Jesus came on the scene, do you know what Judaism had become? An ethical cult. It had become a salvation by works religion. I'm good enough I don't need Jesus. I do this, I don't do that. Wow. Got that in our churches, huh? Jesus comes and looks at him and said, you better make up your mind. Anybody remember the pinnacle indictment that he gave him in Matthew 5, verse 20? Accept your righteousness, exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. You will in no wise enter the kingdom. I know what the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was. We said it before. I've got 1,000 points. I ain't perfect. I've messed up 200 of them. But I still got 800, Brother Orville. And Jesus comes back. He's going to look at my 800 and say, well, at least I'd weigh the two. You get in. No, sir. There's one way to get in. Jesus' is righteousness. That's what this whole sermon is about. Gets to verse 13 and 14, and he says, enter in at the straight gate. Then he mentions two gates. Anybody know what they were? A wide gate and a narrow gate. I want you to get the choices with various options now. Jesus said the two gates, wide and narrow. 
There are two classes of people, many and few. There are two destinations, destruction and life. Wow. Goes a little further, there are two kinds of trees, good and evil. Goes a little further, two kinds of fruit, corrupt and good. And he gets down to verse 24 of where we picked up, and he says, and by the way, <laughs> there are two builders. Uh-oh. The question this morning is whether resolve at the end of an, of, of, of an old year, getting ready to go into another one, the question that is asked this morning, are you stormproof? I think I'm going to ask it again. Are you stormproof? Is this what Jesus is asking? Whosoever, that's the same whosoever in John 3, 16. That's anyone. Anyone who hears these teachings of mine. The thing about it, everybody in the crowd heard. If you read that sermon in Matthew 13 that we didn't mention where he gave the parable of the sower, remember that? He gave four types of ground which is indicative of the heart. Four types of ground was wayside, stony ground, thorny ground, and a good ground. The disciples asked him, what in the world are you talking about? He said, the wayside is a non-responsive hearer where they come. And they well, man, when are you going to get through? It's time to go. Yeah. Said the word went forth. They didn't want it. He said, but the devil said, I'll take it. You don't want it. Make sure you don't get it again. Then there was a stony ground hearer. Said that's that hearer that hears the word, but looking for emotionalism. Thinks somebody wants to come in and just motivate. Folks, no preacher ought to consider himself a motivational preacher. You can't read this book and the promises that are in it and can't be motivated. I don't know if anybody can motivate you. In fact, Paul says it is the love of Christ that motivates us. You can't look at Calvary and be motivated then write Ichabod on the door. Anybody know what Ichabod means? The glory of the Lord has departed. We don't need anybody to come in to motivate. But this is that emotional hearer. Jesus said they come in, they hear something they like, they get emotionally stirred up, and they leave and they skip to my loo. Jesus said, but the word didn't take root, and then they went out and they ran into persecution, trial, hardship, tribulation. And they're like, this ain't for me. Nobody told me about this and said they turn. Wow. Then he said that third type of ground was a thorny ground here. You can pick this up in Matthew 13, verses 18 through 22. Said that thorny ground here was that heart that had all that other, you know, like he, he likened it to a ground with a lot of weeds in it. Where the sower went and throwed his seed out without getting all the weeds out. And by the time he got through, the weeds overtook the real plant. Jesus said the thorny ground here is the one who has a lot of covetousness, worries of the world all in his heart. And they come and they sit, can't. Pay attention to the word because of all this other stuff. Chokes the word out. But then finally he said there is some seed that fell on the good ground. These were the ones that became disciples. Made disciples. Jesus is here saying, hey, whoever hears these sayings of mine. Wow. And practices them. It's the present part of simple. All the time. I will show him or her. For you ladies in the house that see Jesus use a masculine pronoun. I will show him who he is like. He's talking to both male and female by the way. I will show him who he is like. Number one is like a wise man. Wow. The word wisdom is an interesting word. It's a word that comes from skilled living. One way to learn how to live skillfully. You heard Pastor Woodell quote that verse that he said his sister-in-law wrote in the leaflet of her book. This is it. Wisdom. I'll show him who is like. He's like a wise man. And here's the wisdom. You get why I ask. Are you stormproof? Who built his house 
Let's put a pin in that. How about we exchange house from family? Because you ever notice when Paul uses synonym for the church, he calls it the house of God, which is the family of God. Here in the Old Testament, the phrase used the house of Judah, which is really the family of Judah. Ever hear the phrase house of David? It's the family of David. Somebody was alluding to Elder Bowman's whole entire family. They'd say the house of David Bowman. They would be meaning the family of Elder David Bowman. The Lord of Jesus says, I will show him who is like. He is like a wise man that built his family. Uh-oh. Now we got to make sure the wife and kids and everybody get it, don't we? Well, this puts a whole nother twist to discipleship, huh? What is that what Peter means in Acts chapter 2 when he says, and this promise is to all in your house? <laughs> what do what Paul means when the Philippian jailer asked him, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved and your house. <laughs> Acts 16, Lydia was saved and her house. Wow. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, I didn't do a lot of baptizing. I remember one family I baptized, Stephanus, and his whole house. Family. I will show him who he is like. He's like a wise man that built his house. Here it is, on a rock. Whew. Who's the rock? Mm. Got any question about it? Read 1 Corinthians 10. Paul says everybody that followed Moses were baptized unto Moses. That means they identify with Moses. They all eat of that spiritual bread, that manna that came down from heaven. And they all drink from that spiritual rock, Paul said, and that rock was Christ. Whew. Ooh. A lot of folk get it twisted when Jesus tells Peter and upon this rock. When talking about Peter, he pointed to himself. There are too many Old Testament verses, boy, that tells you Jesus is that living stone. Daniel saw, or Nebuchadnezzar saw, four successive kingdoms that would run their course. And boy, do your homework. They did it. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And Daniel said, but there's another kingdom that I don't think you saw. It's going to be hewed out of the side of the mountain like a stone. This stone is coming to shatter all of the other kingdoms into pieces. Isaiah wrote about it. Isaiah 28, 16, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone. Here's the word, a sure foundation. Wow. David wrote about it in Psalm 118, verse 22, The stone the builders rejected. Same has become the headstone of the corner. There'll be folks rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, but I got news for you. I still will be the smiting stone. Woo! Jesus said, I will show him who he is like. He is like a wise man that built his house on a rock. That's foundation. There's some construction magnets in the house. You know something about a foundation, huh? Folks, if the foundation is wrong, the rest of the building is over. It's over. Ephesians 2, 20 through 22, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. It's foundation. We work and we labor together with God and all the stuff that we do, we don't do it into ourselves. You know why? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 11, for another foundation can no one lay except that one which is already laid. Jesus Christ. That's the real foundation. And folk, the way you find yourself storm-proof and your family storm-proof, hey, we better make sure they're on rock. I want you to stick with me now because Jesus said there's a storm coming and none, none like we've ever saw. I will show him or her who they're like. They're like a wise man that built their house on a rock. Watch this. The, the rains came down. Rains a lot, floods of sin, huh? Wind blew and beat on the house and guess what? It didn't fall. Why? Because it was storm proof. Wow. Here comes a sad one, folks. But all whoever hears these sayings of mine, notice everybody heard. Everybody had a choice to do with the word. What? It's 
why Jesus, to all seven churches, let him or her that have ears to hear, and he's talking about spiritual ears, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. By reason of any unfortunate circumstances, people are incapable, unable, everybody has the opportunity, first of all, to hear, process it, and then do something with it. Secondly, he or she that hears these teachings of mine and does not put them to practice. So we're making disciples. Folk got to know this. I will show him or her who they are like. Here's that word. It's a strong word. They are like a foolish man. Jesus used the word fool a few times. We've got a word in our vernacular. Ever heard it? Moron. That's where the word comes from. You see Jesus used the word fool. It comes from the word moros, which means stupid. For somebody to hear the gospel of Christ and decide they don't want that to be their foundation, that's stupid. No other way to put it. Brother, you're judging. Jesus said it, I didn't. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not put them to practice, I will show them who they're like. They're like a foolish man. Woo. Who built his house, uh-oh, on the sand. Whew. Ever hear that song? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground. Folks, if you're outside of Christ, ain't on a sure foundation, I got bad news for you. Jesus said it. Somebody's looking. I will show him or her who they're like who built their house on the sand when the rains came and the floods ascended. Winds beat and blew on the house. It fell. And why would Jesus add and great whew, was the fall of it? Folks, we've got work to do. Jesus calls us and we make a commitment and we're disciples. We got to make sure our children are disciples. Then they've got to pass it on to the next generation. They what Psalm 78 said. Asaph wrote that great historical song. We've heard of the great things that God done for his people. All of the miracles that he wrought. What a testimony he said among his people. We will tell them to our children that they may teach them to their children, that they may pass them on to the generations that will be born. It's true discipleship. And Jesus in the upper room with his disciples and he makes a statement. John 15, 14, 15, and 16. Henceforth I've called you not servants, but I call you friends. For whatever things I have received and learned from the Father, watch this, I have passed it on to you. Wow. Every minister and servant or missionary or laborer that this church brings in to orate the word of God, they're passing it on. Folks, you got to get it. Can't drop the baton. We hear that illustration before? You drop the baton, you're disqualified. When we reach a stick out to our children, they grab it, we better make sure they got it. This is serious, folks. She's talking to a multitude, for many of them, you heard Brother Platt say, that believes they're on their way to heaven, but they're only religious. They have placed their faith in Christ Jesus, they want to hear the gospel. Folks, this man made some statements that you had to know who he is that nobody could make. It's not only what Jesus did and who he is as a person, but it's what he said. Well, just think about some of the statements that he made. You're like, who, if he was just a human being, would make statements like that? John 5, 24, he who hears these sayings of mine shall not come into condemnation and believeth on me, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Wow. Who can make a statement like that? How about this one, John 8, 24, when he looks at some religious folk. Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Wow. Woo. How about this one, John 14 and 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Did you notice he used definite article? He didn't say a way, a truth, a life. 
This is exclusivity. We sung that song early, and boy, couldn't nobody get that alleluia, alleluia, like Elder Bowman. Boy, he was getting, whoa, man, kidding him. But you notice at the end of every one of those refrains, you are the only one. Where we got that from? Ever heard that phrase, only begotten? Comes from two words, monogenes. Mono only, genes of his kind. And I told you before, when you see John use the word only begotten, he's saying Jesus is the only one of his kind. <laughs> he is in a class all by himself. There is no other like him. This is the one speaking. Two gates. Two classes of people. Two destinations. Two builders. Two foundations. Uh-oh. One storm. Do I need to tell you and me? Storm is coming. It is inevitable. And folk, the way things are going now, I may as well use another word. It is imminent. It's going to happen. And the question this morning is, are you storm proof? Are you on a true, firm foundation? Or if you can't answer that question unequivocally this morning and state with clarity and conviction that, hey, I'm on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you can't say that, you think the saying they got over at the NASA Center when they have some trouble shooting Houston, we have a problem? Be on the wrong foundation. Jesus comes back in return. You have a problem. And it is serious. Of all the verses that we hear about, you know, hell and damnation, because you heard Brother Platt use the word over and over again, damnation. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, he uses the word some six times in just a few verses. Verse 14, he that believeth on him hath eternal life and shall not perish. Verse 16, he that believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, he that believeth shall not come into condemnation. Verse 18, twice, Nicodemus, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And for the sixth time in verse 19, Nicodemus, this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Remember Jesus, the six I am's in John, the one he said he's the light of the world? It's interesting at in the time he chose to use it. We'll bring this thing to a close. Some self-righteous, implacable, self-exalting religious leaders were peeping in the tents. This was the Feast of Tabernacles that they'd commemorate every year, you know, to remind themselves. Remember I told you, retrospect? They were commanded to keep the Feast of Booth to remind them where they dwelt in tents while they were in the wilderness. Jesus would always be a part of this great commemoration and boy, these self-righteous folk would probably go around peeping in tents and seeing what's going on and they said they found a woman involved in sexual immorality. Call it adultery. Deuteronomy says man and the woman. I'm still wondering whatever happened to the man. But it was to mess with Jesus. He's teaching in the temple. He's probably sitting. Folks are proverbially eating out of his hand. They come in dragging a woman. She's probably screaming. All you got to know how women weren't too much protected by the law. They really mistreated. They came and they slung her before Jesus as he He's teaching. And they came and looked at him and said, uh, 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 excuse me, sir, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. The law says one ought to be stoned. What do you got to say? Now, you got to remember, they didn't even carry that out. 
I want to see what Jesus said about the law. Watch this now. He didn't respond. John used the present part of simple. They kept on asking him. Well, what you got to say? Watch what he done. And they kept on asking him. We're making all this much ado. Or what did he write on the ground? I bet he wrote this. When I read this passage, you know what the most important thing with this is? Because you got to remember the woman is on the ground. She's humiliated. So one thing you know, regardless of what Jesus wrote, when he stooped, he came down to the woman's level. And they kept on asking him finally stood up and said, excuse me, is there any one of you who had not sinned? If it is, reach in your pocket and start throwing your rocks. And incredible how we come to church on Sundays, just throw rocks at folks. Talk about conviction. Said they had to file out from the eldest to the youngest. Said when there were no one there but Jesus and the woman, he looked at and says, where are those your accusers? Are there any of them still here who have condemned you? Watch this confession. No man, Lord. <laughs> wow. He's like, this woman knows who I am. Neither do I condemn you, but go and do not continue living in sin. Now watch this, I am. Now here it comes. They were in the temple, and you know, there was that great menorah, the great candles. I mean, it illuminated the place. And folk would come into the temple, and they were enamored by the lights. Ooh, wow, look. And Jesus stood up in John 8 and 12 and said, I am the light of the world. He that believes in me shall not walk in darkness. This is what Jesus is teaching in the sermon. Folks, this is an appeal. He's giving them a choice with some options. And everybody in the house at some point have or still have to make it. And I just want you to think as we Bring this thing on to a close all down through the ages of time. Humanity had been given choices. Eh? Adam, every tree of the garden, I've given you to freely eat. But Adam, there's one tree in the midst of the garden. I'm commanding you to never eat up. On the day that you do, you shall surely die. I remember the choice Adam made. We ought to remember it because we see the effects of it in Romans chapter 7. And it hits us all, doesn't it? It's to Moses' day. He's got a multitude of people there and he's giving them choices and he gets to the end of his sermon, Deuteronomy 30 and 19. I'll call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life. Wow. That both you and your family, wow, shall live. Whew. Moses passed the baton on to who? Joshua. Joshua gets to the end of his days in Joshua 24 and 15. If it seems evil for you to serve the Lord God, choose you this day who you will serve. So my parents need to get this next line, boy. Quit letting these kids run over us. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. You say, you tell them folks, as long as you're under my roof, you're going to go by my roofs. <laughs> this is just the way it go. Joshua's gone. Here comes Elijah in the great day of apostasy. People deciding God's not enough. We've got to serve Baal. It's the world's way. God said, I want you to go get Ahab, and I want you to bring him to Mount Carmel, and I want you to challenge him. 
Elijah comes to Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, 21. He says, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? Whew. God is God, you better serve him. But if Baal is God, help yourself. Woo! Then here comes that great judgment prophet. His name is Joel. Joel 3, 14. Joel, you could hear him. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decisions. The day of the Lord is at hand in the valley of decisions. Ooh, sound like Jesus telling these people it's decision time. Which one? Wide gate, narrow gate. Be a class of the many or the few. There'll be a few go down the narrow gate. Broad gate. Broad gate is religion, by the way. Pretty incredible. I ask you a question. Have you ever seen these cults and off-brand religions with a marquee over their church that says, come go to hell with us? Don't see it, do you? It's deceptive is this is the way to heaven. We're on the right track. That's Broadgate. Everybody's like, oh, that's the way I want to go. Then here comes John the Baptist, that forerunner before Jesus. Pharisees comes to him and the Sadducees, and they're rejecting his baptism. John's baptism was a baptism that says, confess your sins and believe on one to come. But they were like, we don't have any sins, so we don't have to be baptized with your baptism. And John looks at him and says, oh, you generation of vipers, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Repent, there's that word, metanoia. Have a change of mind that it may change my direction. <laughs> I was going this way and I heard the word and learned right and I turned to go the other way. I got to make sure they get the right repentance. This is one in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11. This is repentance that work at godly sorrow that you don't regret. But there's another repentance we got to make sure because there's too many of these kind of repentance. Anybody ever remember Judas? Somebody like Matthew 27, 3 through 5 said Judas repented. No, it didn't. It said he repented himself. It's a different word. It's not metanoia. It's metaloma. Metaloma is I regret and sorry that I got caught. And there's too much of that. John says repent. Bring forth fruit that shows you have repented. Stop beating your chest saying, I'm a descendant of Abraham. So God is able to raise up stones of Abraham. And watch what John says. Now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. I don't know about you, but anytime I see an axe laid at the root of a tree, that means the tree is fixed to come down. The axe is laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bring forth fruit is coming down. Now watch how John gives him a choice now. I verily indeed baptize you with physical water, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and lace. He is going to baptize you first with the Holy Ghost. Then when he returns, he's coming back with the baptism of fire. You know John is referring to judgment because watch how he kept it whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat will be cast into the garner and the chaff will be cast into unquenchable fire. Then when John had finished running his race, here comes Jesus. This is his sermon letting people know there's a choice that's got to be made. When we're out saying we're making disciples, maybe a good way to get in is somebody's asking, are you on the true foundation? What are you talking about? Then we let them know, huh? Are you stormproof? Your family stormproof? You heard last week how Jesus came down through generation after generation after generation. Fulfilled all of those prophecies. Came and did as Philippians 2, 9 through 11 said, died the ignominious, reproachful, shameful death of the cross. But he did it for you, 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 and me. 
2 Corinthians 8 and 9, do you not know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that he was rich? But he became poor for yours and my sake, that you and I may be made rich through his poverty. Wow. Whew. Paul said, wherefore God had also highly exalted him and had given him the name that is above every name. That at the name that belongs to Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every good angel in heaven, every fallen angel who is reserved for judgment, and every human being who is breathing God's air and who have died will confess. And every knee shall bow. What side are you on? Paul says... Bow now by, 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 by volition or bow later by compulsion. Whew. Or humble or be humbled. It's coming, folks. And so the question again as we just turn this service back over to the hand of the Lord, the question is everybody in the house, are you stormproof? It means are you on the true foundation? Because you already heard the storm Jesus talking about. Dispensation of grace is coming to an end. Dispensation of the eternal ages and judgment is on the horizon. Everybody's got to look him in the face. Which destination? Father, we thank you. Again, we praise you for the word that you left us on record. That we share with people. Challenge people, Lord, that they're still choice to make so pray now that you'd have your way as your spirit Lord God is moving in the house your glory fill this house and your name is exalted someone may come running to you through conviction in your drawing recognizing their need to be saved before it is everlasting too late thank you for who you are praise you for all you're doing Lord, I want to give you the glory. All we anticipate and expect you will do is our prayer and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.